Unwritten contains mature language, content, and themes. Please listen with care. Previously on Unwritten. Sarah's a philosophy major and all-around superstar. I don't know, it was like a painting of hipster porn. Painting? Do you know which one? What did it look like? I don't know, some purply naked crap. Was it the acrobat? The what? It's by Picasso. I'm just saying, even straight-laced Dean Wagner has a tattoo. You do not. But I do. What is it? A large, two-story house has a long driveway cut through thick woods. New Cadillac in the driveway. In the kitchen, Gerald quickly chops an onion on a wooden cutting board. He picks up the cutting board and slides the diced onions into a pan. The onion sizzles upon contact. Gerald presses a clove of garlic onto the cutting board and chops it. He adds the garlic to the pan, followed by oil. Gerald turns down the burner. He turns and walks to the dining room. He admires the table set up for the romantic dinner for two. He takes out his date night sterling silverware from the nearby cabinet and examines it in the light. He begins setting the knives, forks, and spoons on the table. Before placing the last knife, he presses the point with his finger. The sharp blade instantly draws a bead of blood from the tip of his finger. Gerald doesn't flinch. He licks the wound absently. Car headlights beam through the large bay window in front of the table. Gerald walks over and pulls back the curtain. A light blue sedan with a broken headlight comes to a halt in the driveway. Gerald turns around and licks the wound once more with a smile. I've got it all It's just unwritten Not putting it off Just trying to figure it out If what I say Comes to fruition With these words I can't play around Walking on a wire Without a net Ending up alone It hasn't happened Dayton Writers Movement presents Unwritten, starring Luna Madison, Jordan Lopez, David Senator, Zach Duncan, Adrian Miller, and I'm Sean Gunther. Episode 4, The Man. Written by Avery Hutto. Directed by Chris Burnside. Also starring Dodie Lockwood, Hope Bazell, Shira Thomas, Trey Cricket, Stephen Kallenberg, Emily Kallenberg, Liz Rosevear. Elaine sits across from Professor Lincoln in Lincoln's office. Professor Lincoln eats her salad with a plastic fork and knife and acts as if no one else is in the room with her. Elaine sits and taps her foot. I can come at another time. Oh, no. Sorry, Elaine. Professor Lincoln shifts her attention from her salad to Elaine. You know, everyone in the department is saying that I should be worrying about you. Oh, I'm fine. It's already been a few weeks, and I've had enough time to grieve. I do sympathize with your friend passing, but I was referencing how you have yet to choose a topic for your thesis. Oh, right. Well, I'm pretty sure the subject that I want to work on is... Elaine, I hate to be curt, but pretty sure just isn't going to cut it anymore. I want a solid answer by Friday. Elaine hangs her head. I understand that you want to have the right topic, but there is no such thing as the perfect answer to any question. Sometimes you just have to be decisive. I just want a topic I really care about. 
I want it to mean something to me, but also mean something more than me, I guess. Well, what do you care about? Elaine sits silently. Try to answer that first. Your thesis topic will come soon after. Elaine stands behind her desk in her classroom shuffling papers. Sarah sits next to Rena in the half-filled room. As they wait for class to start, Rena asks Sarah about a date. So are your parents pissed? No, I just told them it was a hit and run. It's only a headlight, so it shouldn't cost that much. And it happened on the way to his house? I was excited and not paying attention, okay? Elaine's phone buzzes. A text message from Chelsea. University gym. One hour. Be there. Elaine texts back. No way. Come on. I need someone to work out with. When there's two of us, the butt stairs feel less penetrating. You work out alone literally almost every day. <sighs> Come on. You don't even have to do much. It'll be fun. And afterwards, we can get smoothies. My treat. Fine. You're lucky I can't resist blended fruits and ice. Sarah elaborates on her date as Rena listens intently. So he served me this incredible meal, and we talked, and it was, I don't know, it was good. He did this whole side smile, soft voice, call me Jerry thing, and I couldn't take it seriously, so I laughed. Sarah giggles again at the memory. <laughs> I made fun of him about it for the rest of the night. Sounds like y'all have chemistry. So, did you? You know. No, you know I'm not like that. I don't think he even cares about it, really. He's not some horny frat bro. We just talked about books and philosophy and art, and it was so refreshing. You two nerds were made for each other. At the university gym, Chelsea runs on a treadmill. Elaine walks on the next treadmill over. Exercise is one of the greatest stress relievers. Mm-hmm. Did you know that they did a study that found that exercise was just as effective as antidepressants? Oh, yeah? Yeah, apparently in mice or something like that. I didn't really read it, but that's what the headline said. Mice love exercise. Yeah, you wouldn't really think that mice get depressed. <sighs> but I'm sure there are days when they eat the last of their cheese, and they're all like, if I want to go to the store, I have to shower and get dressed, so instead I'll just sit here and sulk, cheeseless. Elaine and Chelsea step off the treadmills and start walking across the gym. You okay? I expected a snarky comment about how mice and humans aren't comparable, or... Modern journalists write overzealous headlines to get the attention of people skimming through articles and blow scientific findings out of proportion. There it is. Sorry, you're right. I'm just frazzled. I have to have my thesis topic by Friday. Ah, deadlines. Want some help brainstorming topics? They pass a flyer that says, Bikini Body Yoga, Trial Class Only $10. You could stick with the overzealous headlines approach. Apply it to this. Get skinny by buying our products. Nonsense. Sorry, honey, my body is as bikini as it's going to get without your assistance. Thank you very much. Now, the ease the unhealthy tension in your shoulders yoga, that's something I could get on board with. Elaine and Chelsea sit on exercise mats and start stretching. A running track encircles the area of the gym mats. Darren runs by with headphones in and takes a quick step to avoid someone who is on their phone and not paying attention. When he does, a money clip falls out of his pocket. Elaine is the only one who notices and quickly gets up to get it. Hey! Hey! Darren can't hear her over his music and continues running. You do realize it's a circular track, right? He'll be back in about two minutes. Oh, right. Darren circles back around, and Elaine waves the money clip to get his attention. Oh, my. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Darren. Hey, Chelsea. Keeping the gym inclusive? Trying to. Those damn sexist ellipticals, though. Chelsea points to the bear tattoo on Darren's arm. Is that a new arm portrait? <laughs> sure is. Got it last week. Elaine squints at the tattoo. What does it mean? Huh? Is it a spiritual bear? Or a statement about conservation? Um, it means I think bears look cool. Darren gives Chelsea a look that says, duh. Gotta run, literally. Thanks again. Good to see you, Chelsea. Darren starts on the track again. Elaine sits back on the mat. Tattoos are so weird. What do you mean by that? Well, I just think it's weird that people permanently inject ink into their bodies so they can look cool. Back to your bikini observation. Everyone is so pop culture trained to be obsessed with looks. Or you're obsessed with everyone else's obsession with looks. Okay, yeah, yeah, but 
Tattoos? Who knows? But everyone has them, so you better get used to it. Even Gerald was telling me about his the other day. Gerald? The boss man. He said he had a tattoo of some famous artsy thing. Hoity, toity, highbrow, such and such. That doesn't surprise me. He used to teach philosophy. Ugh, you sound like one of his groupies. He's that popular? If one more co-ed pokes her head into my office trying to find him, you should see the way they fall all over him. It's embarrassing. But look at the men they're stuck with at that age. My student Greg, the one I'm always complaining about. You should hear the things that come out of his mouth. I was teaching Picasso yesterday Picasso! And... That's it. That's what? Gerald's tattoo. Picasso. Gerald has a tattoo of Picasso? Uh, no. One of his paintings. Oh. Anyway, so I'm teaching Picasso at... Which painting? How am I supposed to know which painting you were teaching? No, the tattoo. This conversation is very hard to follow. Gerald's tattoo. Which Picasso painting was it? Why? You want to see it? Elaine stares anxiously. I don't know. Circus, acrobat, trapeze? The acrobat? Sure. Elaine collects her things and stands up. Ready to go? Elaine ignores Chelsea. Laney? Elaine walks quickly to the door, almost colliding with a runner as she crosses the track. Chelsea watches her go, thoroughly confused. But, but, blended fruits and ice! Elaine's Apartment Elaine stands in her living room, watching Lita's painting as if it might come to life. Come on, Lita, talk to me. Behind her, a shadowy figure moves through the darkness. Was it him? Dracula, wearing a black cape that is outlined in red, looks through the kitchen cabinets. You know she is never going to respond. Elaine continues to study the picture. Dracula finds a dusty bottle of red wine in one of the cabinets. He pours himself a glass. This isn't as good as the real thing, but it'll have to do for now. Don't you want to suck my blood? Uh, I have a very sensitive palate, and you, my darling, do not fit it. Dracula walks over to Elaine. He swirls his glass of wine and takes a sip. <sighs> Why do you care what made her do it? It's not like you could ever do anything about it. She did it for a reason. What if Lita painted the acrobat because of Gerald's tattoo? What if he did something to her? Ah, and you are going to be the sweet protector of the innocent when you can't even take care of yourself. Bravo, dear. I'm fine. I just want to do what I can to help. Gerald had to be involved. It makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> not really. I don't see why he would want to hurt anyone as sweet and dark as the girl who made this painting. Besides, it's not like he made her do it. He wasn't even here. You were. But what Mike said, Lita had some kind of relationship with the acrobat. And he broke her little heart, so she decided to decorate the pavement. There must be more to it. A secret affair with an older, powerful man? Chelsea said he's always flirting with the girls. No, she said they flirt with him. Elaine ignores Dracula as she continues speculating. He's a predator. Who knows what he did to her? You've always liked him. Everyone likes him. Chelsea claims he is a good person. What if he didn't think what he was doing was wrong? What if he justified his actions because it was for his own good? Know anything about that, Dracula? You are obsessing. I would know. I'm not obsessing. I just care about this. Elaine's eyes open wide as she makes a realization. Not wanting to write, needing to write. This is what I need to write. My thesis. A case study on Gerald Wagner. Uh, I'm sure your advisor will be pleased that your thesis topic is your hunch that the dean is a sexual predator. I'll... I'll just... Tell her that I'm examining gender dynamics. She doesn't need to know that it's about Gerald. And do you think you have enough evidence based on what exactly? You think that tattoo is just a coincidence? Yes, but if I know vampires, and I know vampires. Oh, really? Do you? Then I know that he probably covered his tracks. 
I can remember one time when I was trying to find a way to enter the castle of a Ukrainian princess. There has to be some sort of evidence. I had to make sure no one saw me or knew what I was doing. It can't just be an isolated incident. So I transformed into a bat whenever anyone was around. Not everyone likes bats, but no one is crazy enough to think a bat killed their princess. There must be a way to prove it. Dracula swirls the wine, tilts his head back, and finishes the glass. <sighs> That's what everyone in the town said. But here I am, living another day as a free vampire. At Gerald's house, two empty glasses of wine sit on an oak coffee table beside a half-full bottle of red wine. Sarah sits on the couch with Gerald. So then I explained to him that he was, like many people do, misinterpreting the metaphor and parables of Kierkegaard. Mm -hmm. It's just that some people don't have the intellectual capacity to understand some things like you and I do. I'm boring you. I'm the boring old man. You're the cute old man. Sarah immediately blushes and turns away. You're a contradiction, my dear. You just make me shy. You aren't shy in your text messages. Sarah blushes again. She cocks her head to study his face. It's easy to hide behind a screen. But when we're together, sometimes I just don't know what to do with you. You're so perfect, I don't want to ruin it. Gerald leans in closer and puts his hand on her knee. Nothing you could do would ruin anything. Besides, I have something very special in store for you tonight. Sarah grins nervously. You do? Gerald moves his hand from her knee and stands up. Tea and biscotti. He winks. <laughs> Black or green? Surprise me. That's my girl. Gerald exits the room. Sarah waits for a few minutes, looking around the room with a soft smile. She hears the whistle of a tea kettle from the kitchen. Gerald enters the room. Rather than walking around to sit on the couch, he walks up directly behind Sarah. He brushes her hair back. She is startled at first, but the corner of her mouth turns up quickly in a shy grin. Gerald bends down and begins slowly kissing her neck. Elaine sits across from Dr. Lemon in Lemon's office. Elaine is almost at the edge of her seat. Scones and tea sit untouched on the table between them. So you have until the end of the week to figure out a research topic? Correct. And you are calm and collected because you think you have a topic, but you aren't going to tell me. Exactly. Okay. Interesting. Well, what is the general area of your studies? Well, it has to do with gender dynamics and university settings. Oh. Definitely a topic that needs to be explored in today's culture. It does. That makes me very happy to hear, Elaine. Elaine and Dr. Lemon sit in silence. Dr. Lemon looks at Elaine, waiting for her to continue. Elaine looks at Dr. Lemon, waiting for her to ask a question. No more questions about the topic? No doubting my decision? No questioning my sanity? I'm here if you want to talk about anything, not to try to force something out of you that isn't ready. That's... nice. Elaine, we've had multiple sessions so far. You should know by now that I won't judge you, yet you're still surprised. I guess it's just refreshing. Does everyone in your life judge you so harshly? So frequently? Not everyone. Just my parents, and professors, and friends. Do they criticize you? Not directly. Then how do you know they're always judging you? Because I don't know because they just are. Dr. Lemon waits, subtly encouraging Elaine to elaborate. Because I judge them. Because I'm honest with myself that we're all judging everyone else all the time, even if no one ever says it. You believe that's how everyone thinks? Of course it is. But it's one of those things you're just not allowed to say. Like having a child was a mistake, or I don't find cat videos adorable. Most people aren't as judgmental as you think. Based on my experience, most people are too wrapped up in themselves to even care about what others are doing. Elaine gets up and paces the room. Dr. Lemon remains seated and doesn't follow Elaine with her eyes. So it's just me then. I'm the judgmental one. Elaine catches a glimpse of a copy of Dracula next to Dr. Lemon's collection of Stephen King novels. She looks around nervously for a moment, 
before returning to her seat. You're being far too hard on yourself. I'm just self-aware. Self-awareness is a very valuable quality. It's something that too few have and many need. We all ask questions to which we already know the answers. We have a need to confirm what we already know. It's a wasted step. Trust what you already know. You are going to make mistakes, but mistakes are a part of life. Often learning from a mistake is better than living with regret. Elaine's apartment. Elaine answers a knock at the door and sees Chelsea standing there, bright-eyed and perky, holding two cups. Morning, sunshine. I brought coffee. Well, coffee for me and tea for you. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. You're welcome. Chelsea hands Elaine the tea and moves past her into the apartment. Elaine closes the door and follows Chelsea inside. Why did you take off yesterday? Big thesis breakthrough. Maybe. Chelsea plops down on the couch. Lay it on me. Elaine stands awkwardly in the middle of the room, deep in thought. She finally sits at the other end of the couch. Something about gender dynamics in universities. I'm interested in powerful men and how women react to them. Well, that's about the most Elaine Harper topic I can imagine, so I'm a fan. Much better than feisty being a misogynistic word. I'm also starting to think sassy is equally problematic. Stay focused, girl. Speaking of gender at universities, how's your job going? Great! Uh, you know I can't speak officially for your thesis, though, right? I'd need to run it through PR. Seriously? Even for a research project? Them's the rules. These are the concessions we make to try and change the system from the inside. Yeah, I guess. Elaine fidgets uncomfortably. So, what's Gerald like? He's great. Dude is brilliant. He's made the campus more inclusive. For example, we both have this huge meeting with the whole Green Dot Committee tomorrow after lunch. He makes these significant, sweeping changes, but he still makes time to work one-on-one -on -one with the staff and students. Why is he so popular? You mean, besides all the reasons I just gave you? I'd hit that. Sound familiar? <laughs> all the girls like him because he's handsome, sophisticated, important. Practically a celebrity on the campus. Um... When you think about it, I guess. Chelsea narrows her eyes at Elaine. Wait a second. How women react to powerful men at universities. Elaine bites her lip sheepishly. You cannot write about co-eds crushing on Gerald. Not for your thesis. Not for anything. I wasn't going to. We have often discussed how you cannot lie to me. Usually right after you try to lie to me. Okay, so maybe I was thinking about it. Why can't I research Gerald? Because it wouldn't look good. Not an effective argument. Is he hiding something? Of course not. These kids are crushing on him, but it's not like he's dating them. And even then, it's not against the rules. Isn't against the rules for a dean to date a student? No. Doesn't that sound wrong to you? Why would it? You're the one who always says the students are adults. They are. What's the problem then? Besides, Gerald isn't doing that. He's a mentor, not a creep. So why can't I look into him if he's completely legit? You have to know how that would look. He's a man. We can't question him because he's a man? <sighs> you shouldn't question him because you have zero reason to. And because he's a man. Any insinuation of improper behavior with female students would look very bad for him. I thought you said that kind of relationship wouldn't be improper. Don't twist my words. I know you teach argument. I can't compete. Just drop the Gerald thing, okay? Write about something else, or write about this in the abstract. Just not about him. Elaine looks down at her tea. If it means that much to you. It does. And it's the right thing to do. Chelsea scoots closer to Elaine and gives her a big smile. You trying to make the world a better place will never get old, Laney. Elaine looks up and attempts her most authentic fake smile. Chelsea, apparently appeased, leans back and drinks her coffee. <laughs> Rena stands in the hallway outside Sarah's dorm room and knocks on the door. She hears nothing from inside. Come on, Sarah. I know you're in there. You can't just mope around all day without telling me why. Go away. Not going away. After a few moments, the door cracks open. Sarah doesn't wait to greet Rena, but instead walks right back to the couch she had been lying on and wraps herself tightly in a large blanket. The room is dimly lit by a muted TV. Why don't you text me? You know I want to hear all the details. So, 
Romantic night with salt and pepper dreamboat didn't go as planned? You're giving me nothing to work with here. I don't feel like talking about it. He doesn't have a secret Canadian wife hiding in a closet, does he? Sarah shoots Rena a look. Oh my god, he has a child. Stop it. So, did you put the moves on him? Rena wiggles her eyebrows with a goofy grin, teasing Sarah. A carefully timed eyelash batting goes a long way. They are both silent for a moment. Rena exasperatedly changes position and looks at Sarah. Sarah, what's wrong? Nothing, I'm fine. Then why aren't you talking? I just don't feel like it. Okay, but I'm not leaving. What are we watching? Cop show reruns? Sarah stares through the TV, not registering what's on it. We had sex? You did? Sarah, silent, does not return Rena's enthusiasm. So, was it good? It... I don't know. Always a risk with salt and pepper. Two sides of the coin. Sexy and experienced? Or boring and tired? Sarah cringes. That bad, huh? Not that. Rena stays quiet, waiting for Sarah to open up. I guess I just don't know how I feel about him. What? Last I heard, the stars aligned when you peered into his bespectacled eyes. He's just been acting different lately. It's probably my fault. It was just a schoolgirl crush anyway. Don't belittle yourself. I'm not. I just mean the age difference became a factor. I didn't know how to communicate with him. But that's something you can work on, right? Sarah wraps her blanket closer around her. Unless you don't want to. I... I just don't think we want the same things. And I didn't realize that until now. Until too late. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Well, is there anything I can do to get you off the couch? I just want to stay here today. It's no big deal. Really, I'm fine. In that case, I'm going on an ice cream run. I'm not really hungry. This isn't about hunger. This is about embracing your allotted wallowing period. And if you wallow, I wallow. We're in this together. Find a tearjerker to stream while I'm gone. Unless you'd rather tend to your emotions with comedy. That works too. Sarah's lips turn up in a small and grateful smile. What's your ice cream order? Just kidding. Stupid question. Anything peanut butter. I'll be back. Rena traipses out of the apartment. As soon as the door closes, Sarah's eyes well up with tears. She takes a quick and shaky breath. She wipes her eyes and regains her composure. She grabs the remote and starts clicking through movies. Elaine works at her computer in her office. She checks an email from Professor Lincoln with the subject line, Thesis Checkpoint. Dracula lurks in the corner with his cape over his face. Will you please close those blinds? This room is brighter than an Icelandic summer. Fine. I like it dark anyway. Elaine gets up and shuts the blinds. Dracula releases his cape and starts walking around the small office. He reads a piece of paper on her desk that says, Thesis Ideas, with a few things scratched out on it. Having some trouble making decisions? It's like you can read my mind. I thought you were going to investigate Dean Wagner. Chelsea doesn't think I should. Oh, Chelsea doesn't think so. Then, by all means, do whatever Chelsea wants. What's that supposed to mean? I just wasn't aware of how domesticated she has you. You'd better hurry home to get her dinner on the table. She brought up some good points. I never let anyone doubt my ideas. I remember one time when I was trying to enter the castle of a Ukrainian princess. Yes, yes, you turned into a bat and no one knew it was you and now you're a free vampire. Yes, that did happen. But I've been alive for a very long time. And there have been many more Ukrainian princesses. They happen to meet my fancy. Dracula smiles and looks blissfully upwards. On this occasion, Van Helsing was trying to convince me that the princess was long gone and that I was wasting my time looking in this particular castle. This isn't about finding a Ukrainian princess, though. This is about figuring out if Gerald has anything to do with what happened to Lita. I nearly let him convince me to stop searching, but I took a chance and went for it. And? 
delicious. Elaine makes a disgusted face. Why are you even here? You know why. You don't need any excuses or naysayers. You need evidence. Where do you suggest I look? The source. Chelsea told you when he'll be distracted. That's when you strike. Professor Lingen enters the office. Dracula retreats to the back corner. A little dark in here, isn't it? It helps me to feel more creative. Does it seem to be helping today? Yes, I've... I've decided on a topic. I just need to research some background to make sure it's viable. How long will this preliminary research take? Graduate thesis presentations are only two weeks away. Elaine looks down, ashamed. I know. I'm sorry. This isn't about an apology, Elaine. It's about math. You have two weeks to research and prepare. The actual thesis doesn't need to be fully written by then, but you need all your research to present. Elaine looks up at Professor Lincoln with a sheepish grimace. Dracula slinks along the wall towards the door and Professor Lincoln, using his black cape to blend with the shadows in the darkened office. I think... I mean, I hope... I'm already certain. I just need to confirm something. I'll finish on time. So what's the topic? Dracula slips behind Professor Lincoln, blocking the door. He peers at Lincoln's neck. Elaine raises an eyebrow in concern. It's about gender. Uh, gender in university settings. I don't want to say too much too soon. I do trust you, Elaine. But it can only help to tell me. I might be able to offer some... Dracula lunges forward to sink his fangs into Lincoln's neck. As he moves, Elaine whirls around and opens the blinds. Dracula recoils from the sudden light flooding the office. He backs out of the office and disappears down the hallway. Professor Lincoln shields her eyes from the change of light. S Sorry, it was just so dark I couldn't really see you properly. Professor Lincoln shakes her head in mild annoyance at Elaine's eccentricity. You know your deadline. Just get it done. And let me know what you need from me. Thanks, Professor Lincoln. Professor Lincoln leaves the office. Elaine collapses into her chair and sighs. You still out there? After a full minute of silence, Dracula pokes his head back into the office, shielding all but his eyes with his cape. Come on, we have work to do. At the school cafeteria, Chelsea walks up to a table where August is sitting alone reading a book. She sits across from him. What up? You're looking at it. August continues to read. Oh, come on. I've only got five minutes left on my lunch break, and I have to be more interesting than... Chelsea flips up the cover of the book August is reading. Mechanical engineering. Gross. Actually, I mean, it's pretty interesting once you get into it. If you think about it, the world would be a lot different without... August looks up and realizes that Chelsea doesn't care. He closes the book and sits up straight, giving Chelsea his full attention. <sighs> without wonderful friends like you to keep me company. How's your day? Going well. A little hectic. And you? Not too bad. I heard about your dinner with Elaine. You okay? Ah, uh, yes. The world's most awkward dinner. She didn't say it was that bad. The other people eating were embarrassed for me. The waiter was embarrassed for me. I'm pretty sure the dinner rolls were embarrassed for me. Oh, August. I shouldn't have even held on so long. She's obviously not into me. Was she ever into me? Of course she was. I mean, we've been friends for years, and kind of, sort of, possibly more than that for a little while. And after all that, I don't even know what she likes. What her type is. Really, was she ever into me? I don't know. I mean, you know her. She's just... You know, she's... She's Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> she still likes you, even if it's not like that. Yeah, I don't doubt that. Yeah, I'll get over her. How do I get over her? You're asking the wrong person. They sit in awkward silence for a little while. So heading back to your office after this? Meeting with Gerald and the Green Dot Committee. Fun. Not really. I mean, my job is great. Gerald is great. But hearing harassment, stalking, and assault stories every week is the opposite of fun. Yeah, I'll probably just make air conditioners when I graduate. <laughs> well, we can't all change the world with Freon, but I'm trying to make a difference. I should get to my meeting. Chelsea stands up. Cool. 
I should get back to studying, which I definitely shouldn't have been doing for the past five minutes. Chelsea flips August off, smiles, and leaves the cafeteria. Elaine lurks just outside the entry to the block of offices that house Chelsea's and Gerald's offices. She pretends to read something on her phone as she listens intently to Gerald's receptionist typing. After waiting a while, she hears the receptionist's phone ring. The receptionist answers. Elaine pockets her phone and walks in to stand at the receptionist's desk. The receptionist smiles at Elaine, recognizing her from her many visits to Chelsea's office. She holds up her index finger to Elaine, indicating that she'll be with her momentarily. Elaine leans in and whispers. I just need to get something out of Chelsea's office for her. Can I have the keys? The receptionist focuses on the phone call for a moment, before rolling her eyes as if annoyed with the caller. Elaine laughs politely. The receptionist takes a ring of keys out of her desk and hands it to Elaine with a smile. Elaine walks down the hall behind the receptionist towards Chelsea's office. She stops outside Chelsea's office and looks around. When she's convinced no one can see her, she hurries further down the hall to Gerald's office. Dracula waits for her at the door. Elaine knocks on Gerald's door. When no one answers, she uses the receptionist's keys to unlock the door. Elaine and Dracula walk into Gerald's office. Elaine shuts the door quietly, locks it, and looks around the room. It's meticulously arranged to the last detail. Ah, the thrill of being somewhere you're forbidden. Brings me back to one time when I was in the castle of a Ukrainian princess. Shut up and help me look. (sighs) And what exactly are we looking for? Anything that connects Lita with Gerald. Or anything else incriminating. There has to be something. Dracula reads the degrees on Gerald's wall before scanning the titles of the books on his bookshelf. Elaine opens drawers on the desk being careful not to disturb anything. Gerald and Chelsea sit in a conference room with the other university officials. The meeting is a little late in starting, and Chelsea is sorting her papers. Do you have the diversity reports? Gerald shuffles through his papers. Well, that's unfortunate. I do not. I'll run back for them. No worries. I can do it. It's just upstairs. This old man can manage. Gerald gets up and walks towards the door. At the same time, in Gerald's office, Elaine leans over the computer keyboard and moves the mouse. The monitor awakens, displaying Gerald's email. Jackpot. Everyone is far too trusting in this century. Elaine searches the email inbox for the keyword Lita. She finds a thread of emails that went back and forth between Lita and Gerald a few months ago. She quickly scans through them, but finds nothing beyond the two exchanging pleasantries and setting up a pair of meetings for seemingly professional reasons. So they didn't know each other. Many people know him. He has a high profile. This proves nothing. We can't leave without finding evidence. As I told you, he would have covered his tracks. That doesn't mean he covered them well. Elaine moves to the email trash and repeats her search for Lita. She finds a single exchange from 29 days ago that will automatically delete after 30. She opens it and reads Lita's words. You know what you did to me. I know you think I can't prove it, but I kept everything. And maybe you're right. Maybe no one would believe me. But after I expose you, who could ever really believe you? I'll fuck your future like you fucked me. Elaine stares at the screen, horrified. Outside the office and down the hall, Gerald steps into the lobby and waves to the receptionist, who is still on the phone. Back in Gerald's office, Elaine scrolls down to read Gerald's reply to Lita's email. I'm sorry you seem so upset, Miss Rios. I don't know why you singled me out as some sort of antagonizer. The two meetings we had in my office seemed very amicable. You need to stop this harassment, though, or I'll be forced to report it, and nobody wants that kind of attention. If you libel or slander me, the university will take you to court on my behalf and their resources are far more vast than a grad student's. I'm sure your family would help you with the settlement you'd need to offer, but didn't you mention that your mother is ill? How would their finances handle this? I think you should see the school's psychological services and get some help. Take care of yourself. Elaine staggers back from the computer. The university will take you to court on my behalf? Oh, he's good. What a monster. This doesn't actually prove anything, you know. Lita said she kept evidence. 
It must be at the apartment. We need to find it. Dracula whirls towards the door. A moment later, Elaine hears the sound of a key in the lock. She looks at Dracula terrified. Hurry! Elaine turns off the monitor and backs into the darkest corner of the room. The door opens and Gerald enters the office. Dracula moves into the corner behind Gerald's back, covering Elaine with his cape. Gerald quickly grabs a folder from his desk and leaves the office without looking around. Once the door is closed and locked, Dracula steps back from Elaine. Always hide where they can see you. That night, Chelsea walks from her car to Elaine's apartment building. She talks on the phone with Drea. Drea, that's sweet, but I'm not interested. Oh, come on. When's the last time you were on a date? I consider that a badge of honor. Dating sucks. Oh, quit being so asexual. You totally love Carmen. And why is that? You have so much in common. Oh, yeah. Like what? Like, um, she's a girl and you're gay. Perfect match. Mm -hmm. You do realize that we have more nuanced turn-ons than just gay, right? You know what I mean. You just can't be as choosy. Why? Because there are so few of us? It's the modern age, Drea. We're here. We're queer. And we're not dating every lesbian you meet at work. Fine. You're lost. She's got a great ass. Maybe you should date her? Maybe I will. But not Saturday, because that's a date with Yumi in August. Elaine will be out of town visiting her family. Okay. And? Nothing. Saturday sounds fun. We'll meet at your place. My place is a total- Okay, see you then. Bye bye Chelsea rolls her eyes, puts her phone into her purse, and enters Elaine's building. Chelsea exits the elevator, moves to Elaine's door, and knocks on it. She waits for a while, then knocks again. Laney? She waits, but hears no answer. She knocks again, this time more concerned. Laney? Chelsea waits a few more seconds, then tries the handle. The door is unlocked. Chelsea opens it and hurries inside. The entire apartment is a mess. Every cabinet and drawer in the kitchen is open, and utensils and other kitchen items litter the floor. The cushions have all been removed from the couch, and one of the armchairs is tipped over. A table lamp is shattered on the floor, and a screwdriver rests next to a printer that's been taken completely apart. Elaine sits in the middle of her living room beside Lita's painting. She's sorting through a pile of socks and underwear taken from the dresser drawer on the floor in front of her. Chelsea stares at the scene in shock for a moment, before rushing to Elaine. My God, Laney! Chelsea kneels beside her. Elaine scrutinizes a sock and does not acknowledge Chelsea. Chelsea puts her hand on Elaine's arm. Elaine gives her a glance through glazed eyes. She stretches the sock between her hands. I'd be able to tell if something were in here, right? What? Laney! Chelsea pulls out her phone. Who are you calling? The police! You were robbed! Elaine snaps out of her stupor. No, 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 I, I wasn't robbed. Sorry, burglarized. Not robbed. Whatever. Put your phone away, Chelsea. I did this. Chelsea lowers her phone and stares at Elaine. You what now? I did this. I was looking for... something... Chelsea surveys the chaos. Looking for something? What the hell were you looking for? Elaine stares silently. In your sock? In your printer? What the actual fuck, Elaine? Elaine looks away. This place is a disaster! Elaine looks back up at Chelsea. Her lip quivers. Chelsea softens immediately. She sweeps Elaine into her arms. Oh, sweetie. What happened? Are you okay? I don't know, Chelsea. Do you need me to call someone? I'll be all right. Chelsea pulls back and holds Elaine at arm's length. You need to decompress. I'll run you a bath, okay? Elaine nods. Chelsea heads into the bathroom. Dracula approaches from behind Elaine. There's nothing here. Perhaps you didn't look hard enough. Where else could she have hidden it? Why don't you ask her? Elaine looks at the painting. She studies the figure of the acrobat in the swirl of the coffee cream. You can't see the Ukrainian princess for the castle. Elaine leans back and takes in the whole painting. She studies the coffee cup itself. Coffee! 
Elaine leaps to her feet and runs to the kitchen, dodging clothes and hopping over a toppled floor lamp. She grabs the large coffee can Lita had purchased, one Elaine had never touched before given her preference for tea. Elaine opens the can. Inside, she sees not coffee grounds, but a rolled-up journal and folded papers. Elaine immediately opens the journal and reads it silently. The pages describe, in great detail, meetings between Gerald and Lita. The first occurred in his office. Later meetings were around campus and in a park. After that, Lita describes going to Gerald's house. Chelsea calls from the bathroom. Did you know that some fancy hotels have tubs that fill in under a minute? I heard that, but I don't think I believe it. That's like sci-fi level plumbing. Elaine reads, her pace quickening, as Lita describes the evening with Gerald, how dinner turned to conversation, turned to making out. Elaine grows more horrified as she reads how Gerald held Lita down on his bed and pulled at her dress, how Lita changed her mind and pushed him back, how he forced himself on her, how he raped her. Elaine lowers the journal with tears in her eyes. Dracula approaches. There is more than one vampire in the world. She looks into the coffee can and sifts through the papers. She pulls out a long, broken strap of a dress, from a dress she recognizes, a dress of Lita's. Almost full. You ready for relaxation? Elaine looks at the journal and the dress strap, then towards the sound of Chelsea's voice. Will she understand, or will she try to stop you? Elaine waits another moment, then stuffs both journal and strap back into the can. She pushes the coffee can to the back of the cabinet and heads for the bathroom. A bath sounds just like what I need. It's on us to stop sexual assault. To get in the way before it happens. To get a friend home safe. It's on us to not blame the victim. It's on us to stand up, to step in, to take responsibility. It's on all of us to make survivors feel safe and supported and to know that we believe them, we support them, and it's not their fault. It's on all of us to change the culture around sexual assault. It's on us. It's on us. It's on us. Join the movement by taking the pledge at itsonus.org. Stay tuned for scenes from our next episode. Dayton Writers Movement presents Unwritten. Executive Producers Chris Burnside, Megan Burnside. Producers, Anna Adamy, Joey Ferber, Jenna Gomes, Cece Hutton, Avery Hutto, Grace Poppy, Tavis Taylor. Sound engineer, Dan Seavers. Script editors, Anna Adamy, Chris Burnside. Script supervisors, Cece Hutton, Grace Poppy. Theme song by Joey Ferber, Kelsey Mills, and Ian Mortison. Unwritten was recorded at Megafauna Sound. For more Unwritten, visit our website at unwrittenpodcast.com. Hey, Unwritten fans. This is Chris from Dayton Writers Movement. If you're enjoying the show, please visit unwrittenpodcast.com slash support to join the movement and get exclusive Unwritten gear that's only available to supporters. If you're a fan of listening to more stories, check out audibletrial.com slash unwritten to get a free audiobook. We appreciate everyone's support as we work to bring you more Unwritten. On the next episode of Unwritten. I'm wondering when I'll reach the age where I'm not mandated to attend family gatherings. Or if that tier of adulthood even exists. Anne Ellen's latest episode was crazy, dude. Mom didn't tell me about it. What happened? They got in this huge-ass fight. Like, you wouldn't believe. He drove Lita to her death. He needs to pay. I've never been a supporter of violence. I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to expose him for the monster he really is. Through my thesis. At my presentation.